there was a, uh, a conference at the NIH back in 2007 uh, to develop a, 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 a statement to improve the use of hydroxyurea. Uh, I went to that conference. It was uh, very well done um, to, to increase uh, the use of hydroxyurea. A survey was done the following year of the adult provider network. I take care of kids, so I wasn't part of the survey, but they asked three simple questions. Have you read the statement? Do you agree with the statement? Do you routinely offer hydroxyurea to your, uh, to your patients? And the providers of color, which have been physicians, nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, anyone able to write a prescription uh, for the providers of color, 100% read it, 100% agreed with it, 98% routinely offered hydroxyurea to their patients. The white providers, 100% read it, 96% agreed with it, only 40% routinely offered hydroxyurea to their patients. And I was one of those providers. This was 2007, 2008. I'm still a fish in the water, not even noticing it. But I remember clearly where I was standing in the clinic when Liz, one of the sickle cell nurses, came up to me and asked me, well, what about hydroxyurea for Mario? I said, he won't do it. I decided he wouldn't do it. I decided he wouldn't go to the pharmacy and pick up his prescription. I decided he wouldn't take his hydroxyurea every day. I decided he wouldn't come to clinic for his blood work every month and then every three months. I decided that because of the narratives of what an 18 year old black boy from North Minneapolis with little or no social support is. And that's not okay. Maybe he would not have been able to adhere to the medical plan because of the barriers in his life, but I should not have been one of those barriers. That was my stereotyping and implicit bias. Now, we all do it. We're human beings. We can have explicit bias or conscious bias versus implicit or unconscious bias. So conscious bias, explicit bias would be I say, I prefer white patients over black patients. I said it out loud, right to your face. And I think I have data to support that belief. 99.9% .9 of healthcare providers do not feel that way. But what's unconscious bias? Well, I gave you an example where I didn't even offer hydroxyurea to a patient because I decided, because of my stereotyping, that he wouldn't do it. In the exam room, what does that look like? It may look like, where am I standing in the room? How long am I with the patient? What's my body language? What's my, what's my tone of voice? Am I looking the family in the eye, right? Um, those are, 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 are uh, implicit uh, bias. Um, these biases are normal, we all do it. They're rooted in stereotyping. You know, in, in humans, we love to put people in boxes, you know, within, a nanosecond, I can walk into a patient room and I have a pretty good idea of the patient's age, race, and their gender. I might have an idea of their religious beliefs or their job or their income based on how they're dressed. And those mean something uh, in our society. Um, we all do it. And the electronic medical record has made it worse. You know, what improves our outcomes is making human connections. When there's human connection, there's trust building. When there's trust, there's a better likelihood the, the patient will follow through with the medical plan. There was a um, editorial in JAMA a few years ago. Um, this is a drawing that a patient's sister did. Here's the patient, she's at her pediatrician's office. Here's the sister who drew the picture. Here's the mom. Well, where's the pediatrician sitting? She's sitting with her back to the family on the computer charting. So this is not a way to make human connections. Um, you know, stereotypes are normal, but they're problematic because it makes one story become the only story. This is a great, great 
quote from Chimamanda Adichie, she wrote The Purple Hibiscus and the Americana, great, great books. So that's what implicit bias is. Well, I have colleagues ask me, well, how do I know if I have implicit bias? Well, the short answer is because you're a human being, we all do it. Uh, but there is a way to try to objectively measure this, something called the implicit association test uh, developed by two social scientists. There's a book called The Blind Spot that discusses the development of the test. It's an evolving test. There's many permutations now. But basically, uh, it's a computer uh, uh, program, sort of game, if you will, shows pictures of human faces and then words. And you associate the word with the face. And the words will be things like rose, thorn, happy, sad, uh, sharp, soft, and even more obvious, good, bad, and, and you associate the word with the face. And it measures your implicit bias. And I do this every year. I usually do it in January. And the last time I did it, I still moderately prefer white people. It speaks to the power of uh, racial narratives and stereotyping. I like to think that I am actively working against it, but I have very high implicit bias. Okay, so I have a lot of colleagues when we do our work say, I understand what it is, I understand that I do it, but does it really matter? Does it really affect care? Well, a couple of recent review articles, this one from two years ago, um, shows that absolutely it does. And it also shows that something that Lou Penner, Dr. Lou Penner, a social scientist, uh, coined the phrase aversive racist. Most physicians and healthcare providers, and myself included, I'm what's called an aversive racist. I have very low explicit bias. I want all of my patients to do well. I feel very strongly about racial equity. But as I shared with you, I have very high implicit bias. And that is what most of us uh, uh, of the trait that most of us have. Um, this uh, uh, study also looked at that idea of trust with better outcomes and gave some ideas about how to intervene. This is uh, um, another recent uh, review article looking at 40 studies. Uh, so it's pretty well known now that if there's racial and or cultural concordance between the provider and the patient, there's better outcomes. There's better communication, there's better trust building, um, and then there's a better outcome. Now, this is not an option for most Minnesotans of color uh, or even Americans of color. Only 4% of licensed physicians in the United States are black. So it's really not an option uh, for, for many uh, patients of color. And I am in full support of uh, programs that are trying to increase uh, the diversity of the healthcare workforce. The University of Minnesota is doing some good work. They have a health professions pipeline program starting uh, in undergraduate to get more people of color into nursing, pharmacy, medical school. You know, these programs really should start in high school and middle school. Um, but I will be dead and gone before the racial makeup of the healthcare team matches the demographics of the populations we serve. So until that time, I need to do the work. My fellow white providers need to do the work uh, to improve our communication and trust building. Uh, this is a great video um, that I would uh, recommend um, uh, everyone watch. We don't really have time uh, to do it uh, now, but it's a seven minute video. Uh, you can uh, search it on YouTube. The folks at Johns Hopkins developed it. It just describes some uh, adult patients' experiences, uh, accessing care, adult patients with sickle cell disease, uh, accessing care in emergency departments, and really illustrates um, uh, implicit bias uh, stereotyping uh, at play. Um, so how do you avoid it? I wanna make sure we have uh, time for uh, discussion. Um, one is using a uh, critical race lens is what I would call it, um, is just that idea of fish in the water. Like you have to force yourself to see the water if you're a fish, right? So start looking at your day with a critical race lens, wherever you are, um, 
you're at Starbucks, you're at the airport, you're wherever you are, how is race playing out in what you see? Uh, the answer may be not at all, which is highly unlikely, um, but we're not gonna see it until uh, we um, actively uh, force ourselves to, to see it. Um, for my fellow uh, uh, white people, uh, my fellow white providers uh, understand this idea of aversive racism and, and prepare yourselves for um, what we call cognitive dissonance meaning you know, physicians, we love our data. Um, and when you see the data of how poorly Americans of color are doing in healthcare, that's very upsetting. Um, and we often wanna catch, we wanna make it about something else. And I still catch myself doing this. I wanna make it about something else. I wanna make it about, well, they didn't have insurance or they don't speak English or some other issue um, without, considering systems of racism, how racial narratives affect our stereotyping um, and how important those are. Um, so, you know, when I say racism, and, and hopefully I've, I've been clear about this, you know, I'm talking about systems and structures. I'm not talking about individuals. Do not confuse the presence of racism with the presence of bad people, especially my fellow white people who may be on the call. You know, we did not ask to be born in this highly racialized society. It's taken us 400 years to get here, but yet here we are. Uh, so I wanna be very clear about that. Um, and for my, for, as we work with uh, healthcare providers, we, we talk about this idea of a health equity timeout. Um, just take a moment to try to be with this patient. Try not to think about the other five rooms that are full and all the charting you have to do and you're on call tonight, uh, but to be uh, in the moment to make a human connection and also to sort of go through the, the power differential. How am I different than the patient I'm about to go see? Now this transcends race. I've been talking about race because I'm white and my patients are black, um, but, but this can be the, these, these processes transcend race. You know, how am I different from the patient around gender identity, sexual orientation? Do you speak English? You know, obesity, uh, other disability, uh, you know, hearing loss, you know, religion, um, you know, race, we talked about ethnicity. You know, that power differential can feel overwhelming. And to take a moment to just realize that power differential. And I can't do anything about it. I can't change it. But what I can do is be aware of it and I can prepare myself for being uncomfortable. As a human being, I'm more comfortable with people who are like me. Here's an example. It is so much easier for me to trust build with a white upper middle-class family from Southwest Minneapolis than it is for me to trust build with someone different from me. You know, even if it is an upper middle class white family from Southwest Minneapolis, you know, say both of the parents are physicians just like me, I still have more power than they do because their kid is sick and they're scared. So layer onto that other differences. And you know, I should be able to trust build and relationship build with a 19 year old single black mom from North Minneapolis with a two week old baby with sickle cell disease on her lap. And if I'm and being honest with you, it's not as easy for me to do that. And I can do it. And historically, I would feel uncomfortable with a patient different from me. And I didn't know what that was. Well, that was my implicit bias coming up. And I would just remove myself from that situation. The clinic appointment's over. But now, instead of leaning away from those moments of discomfort, that's when I need to lean into those moments. And when I start to feel uncomfortable, that's when I need to sit back down, pull my chair up closer to the family, look the mom in the eye, you know, apologize, but say, you know, can I pronounce, can you help me pronounce your baby's name again? Um, that's when I need to, to be in that moment more strongly and lean into that discomfort. 
Um, now, one thing that our group did, many of you know, when, when Ray was our sickle cell family health advocate, and now she's for, you know, you know, full time at the, the foundation and um, uh, you know, hired a replacement. You know, Ray was able to trust build with a family in four minutes. That might take me four hours, four months, four years, or, or maybe never. Um, so that's something that was very helpful in our program to help with that racial and cultural concordance. And again, um, I can do this work. You know, we, we can't get rid of our implicit bias. If you're in an organization and you, know, you have someone come in and say, if you, if you give me a lot of money, I can come in and remove everybody's implicit bias from the organization, you know, run for the hills. You know, that is not a thing. Um, but what we can do is recognize when our implicit bias is at play and when it comes to the conscious, and then we have a decision uh, about what we're going to do. So other things uh, more broadly that, that we can do is looking at policies of your organization with an equity lens. I know Children's is doing a good job with that. Um, looking at individual patient cases. Uh, uh, Kamara P. Jones has a great article in TED Talk called The Gardener's Tale, which looks at levels of racism. I've got a list and, and, and Ray, we can make these uh, uh, available uh, to everyone. Um, there's some good podcasts. Uh, um, at Children's, we've had the, the benefit having both John Bewin and Shankar Vedantam come speak uh, at our organization. They have great podcasts that really are talking about this, this you know, seeing white is more about you know, fish in the water. Um, and the hidden brain is our, our implicit biases, not just around race. Um, you know, take a time out uh, to be in the moment. Uh, this is really about humanism and making human connections um, to improve trust, um, which improves outcomes. And then um, I encourage my colleagues uh, to keep learning and keep talking and, and, and uh, uh, ongoing training. And I'm continuing to learn about these issues uh, every day. So we will end with that um, and some time for discussion and questions. Uh, Martin Luther King said it better than anyone. And I like to include this quote from James Baldwin because this can feel overwhelming. So then we get paralyzed and don't do anything. This is hopeful work. Things can get better and things will get better. Thank you for your time. That is awesome, Dr. Nelson. Thank you so much. And, you know, you gave us so much to think about. And um, the way that you presented it, as I said from the beginning, the authenticity um, from which you speak about this topic, particularly as a white male um, and in the system of healthcare um, and in most systems of, of this country, um, that you represent the dominant presence, right? And so for you to be able to step um, outside of your privilege, but using that privilege to continue to have these discussions um, and to even provide solutions, we are so grateful. I want to read a couple of questions while we have about, um, we have about 14 minutes left before we need to wrap up. But uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, one is a comment, and, and I'll start with that because it's so important. Um, this is from Yvonne Carroll, uh, who is a uh, nurse practitioner um, and, and works with sickle cell as well. Um, and she just wanted to remind you that she loves this presentation. Thank you for um, doing all that you do, trying so hard. We wish we could clone you. And I think that that is probably um, mirrors so many people's thoughts um, outside of uh, not just Minnesota, but outside of children's and other systems. But the first question that we have is, I am a white mother with a 21 year old black son. I also have recently become a certified advocate as well. I have been working for three years to get equitable care for my son that is labeled a drug addict. What are your suggestions for advocacy in the heat of the moment with healthcare providers who have not done anti-racist work or are even familiar with this? Bringing up medical research tends to upset them more. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a tough one. That, that's, there's so many barriers to this work. Um, 
you know, and the heat of the moment is not the time to do anything. <laughs> and, and, you know, Ray, I will, I, I will, you know, defer to you on, on some of that. And, and I, and I don't know your frustration, but I, but I am that other side, right? So one of the barriers I see is this ego, the ego of the physician. I have had on three separate occasions when I've done this kind of work, I've had physicians tell me that, that, that I have insulted their intelligence. <sighs> you know, the more I do this work, the longer I realized that it, it's not that I wasn't educated about systems of race and racism in this country. I was actively miseducated about how race and racism work in this country. Now, I grew up in Virginia in the 60s, so maybe it was a little more uh, exaggerated, but, but I'm like, we have to like undo what we think we know about this, all right? And um, so I... Uh, I, I, this is not surprising for me to, it makes me sad, you know, to hear this uh, 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 comment, you know, bringing up, you know, research upsets them more. That's that, that's that ego thing, right? Um, I think what you can try to do uh, in the heat of the moment is, is to ask for someone who can be an advocate for you. I think in most organizations, um, there is, um, you know, a, patient care representative, and you're probably tired of doing that. But I can tell you one thing that Children's is doing, uh, because everybody can get on board with quality and safety. Um, you know, equity is part of this. An equity climate is a safety climate. And uh, Children's, as many organizations, uh, have safety learning reports. Like if you see like a near miss or a medication error, you can report that. It goes to this committee. You hopefully will change uh, systems to try to prevent that from happening again. Well, at Children's, they now have an equity learning report. This would be a perfect example where patients, families, staff, anyone who sees uh, or experiences uh, some discrimination or sees a policy that's not you know, uh, equitable, then that can be reported. And it goes through the Health Equity Council and is, is reviewed. Um, so it, in, in the heat of the moment, that can be uh, you know, really tricky um, to do. I, I would agree. I think that, um, you know, once you, uh, it, having worked on the inside of the system, um, you know, when you reach someone who already has that wall up, it's very difficult in the moments of need, right? We come into the emergency room and we are already in a vulnerable state. We need the assistance. That's why we came. We need the assistance of, of the experts who are there. And if the experts are already responding with a wall that they've built in that moment, we may not be, a, that one person may not be able to be the solution. However, are there other individuals within our reach at those moments? moments who can um, kind of break down some of those barriers. Is there an advocate that is present that works in the uh, emergency room? Is there um, another doctor or another nurse? Is there someone that you can speak with on the side? I think that it is important and that, that there it are um, our advocates on the inside that can work with families who have advocacy on the outside. Um, and it's pairing those two together. And so my hope is that more systems through that equitable lens and through the equity work that's being done in many institutions, that they start to create roles um, and, and for advocates within their system. Advocates who have either a lived experience or who have expertise that they can give in those times. And, and oftentimes it's those advocates from the inside who are, are well prepared to navigate that system that pushes back uh, against um, these types of situations. So thank you for your question. Um, this is another good, good question. And, and this kind of, um, you gave some solutions in your presentation that I think will speak well to this, but as an advocate for the sickle cell population, how do you navigate relationships with members of a team that demonstrate implicit bias on a daily? Pretty much, how do we change the system while working with the system? That is an excellent question. It speaks a little bit to the previous question, and it also speaks to um, the work that, that I do, as I said at the beginning, I am not here to talk about the experience of a person of color, but I do know what it is to be a white man physician. It takes one to know one, right? And, and what I do to try to move my colleagues on this topic is to, to really 
reach for their personal motivation. Why did you become a physician? Why did you become a nurse practitioner? Why did you become you know, whatever it is? And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's this noble answer. And I want good outcomes and quality care for all of my patients. And that's great. Well, then I show them the data. Well, this is what we're doing. And I prepare to pick them up off the floor, <laughs> you know, sometimes, right? So I try to make it about what, what do they really want? Now, rarely you're gonna get, I'm gonna get a colleague, as my grandma used to say, some pancakes just can't be flipped, right? I'm not gonna be able to move them. All right, yes, that's sad, but move on. You know, it's okay to put my energies and resources somewhere else. Now, that person is still practicing and, and in my mind is, is a danger <laughs> to, to, to people of color. Um, so how do we change the system? So there, there's, there's, moving, there's moving individuals. So I try to get to their core values. Then there's moving organizations. Like is the, is the organization you know, you know, mission-driven, vision-driven? I can give you a perfect example. Um, is uh, uh, I was on the board of the hospital at Children's Minnesota for four years. And the vision of our organization is to be every family's essential partner in raising healthier children. And I would have to raise my hand and point out, guys, it says every. It doesn't say families that speak English. It doesn't say white families. It doesn't say families with insurance. It doesn't say families who are US citizens. It says every. And this is what's happening. So the organization can either change their mission and vision, right? Or, or do something about it. So, so there's, there's a couple of ways to, you know, to get to it. And, and honestly, for me, here's one of the privileges that I have, right? As a white man, I'm in the room, I'm on the board of the hospital and, and my colleagues will often listen to me as we talk about these issues. You know, Ray could say the exact same thing I'm saying, same volume, same tone of voice, same body language. And she may be viewed as an angry black woman. Whereas I can say the same exact thing, which makes me angry. And it just sort of reinforces the whiteness of the whole system. But I'm hoping that I'm going to use my power uh, for, for good, uh, if you will. And one thing I do for my, my colleagues, my white co colleagues, you know, I, this idea of felt, found, feel. And this is honest, right? I will say, you know what? I felt that way because I did. 10, 12 years ago and before. Well, now I found out this information, part of my ongoing education around racial justice. And now I feel this way, right? So I, I, I try to tell my own personal story to move my colleagues. That was a very long uh, answer to your question, but, but there's ways to move individuals as well as organizations. And I agree. I love what you said. As, as for, speaking from my personal experience as an advocate on the inside of the system, one of the things that I strategically did, um, and it was very, very intentional, I can tell you that many of my days were spent intentionally, um, you know, adhering to a strategy that I held on to is who are my champions on the inside? Who do I know that is, that understands my role, understands why I'm here, understands the challenges ahead of me, and who is willing at just the right times to step in if they need to, who may have a stronger voice than I do. I knew that Dr. Nelson was there to speak on my behalf. I was going to push that wall as far as I could without deteriorating the role. And then I'll reach into my back pocket and say, okay, Dr. Nelson, this is, here's the challenge. Here are the things that I've done to try to, um, to, to approach the issue. Here's some of the pushback that I'm getting. Um, and and how, how do you see yourself being able to intervene on behalf of this particular situation? There are times that I am very specific about changing or attempting to reach 
people. And then there are times that I am very specific and intentional about trying to reach the system. And there most, as I said, systems have some level uh, or, or some semblance of a DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion office. Um, I, I sought out opportunities to work very closely with, um, with that department and individuals in that department. If there are um, work groups at your institution that you can join around this work, that's one way. Find your equity village where you're at right? When you find that village, that village is often quite diverse. And if it's not, that should be the goal. And then utilizing that village to talk through many of the challenges um, that are had. Um, and then making sure that you are, if, if once, once you've done all that you can, and you have, um, you know, made every effort to solve these solutions as an individual and as a team, making sure that you're documenting very specific incidences where you may have been mistreated or the situations that you are advocating for may have been mishandled so that you can kind of create timelines of what is happening and show that there's a pattern of these behaviors and that they're not just one-offs. It's not individual, that, but you're showing this pattern. So those are things that I found as well um, in helping, but find your equity village on the inside of your system. Um, last but not least, we'll wrap it up then, as most healthcare providers are not intuitively inclined to lean into their discomfort, especially in the adult setting. What do you think adult providers can do that pediatric providers are doing? Is there a way that there can be collaboration between pediatric and adult providers? Uh, so that's such a great question. And it really just illustrates that whole idea of transition to adult care. And I know that you're going to have a session on that. It's a national problem. Um, you know, I, I think there are ways that the pediatric team can work with the adult team with that tra uh, transition, but it's very different. And, and I, I wish there was something that we as pediatricians could do. We're just trained differently. And, and I think some of it speaks to just this idea in our country and society, this myth of meritocracy, right? Where you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do it. So when, when you're an adult, just, do it. You're an adult. And sort of uh, this idea that you don't need any uh, help or, or help navigating. And, and that's unfortunate. And, and hopefully within the uh, adult systems, as Ray was saying, you can find an equity village. Um, but that, that's, that's a huge problem, especially for our sickle cell patients. So I would agree. And I just, I want to, again, thank you, Dr. Nelson. We often talk about community advocates, um, sickle cell advocates. Um, I want to remind everyone on this call that we are all advocates in, in the space we are in. So whether you are a patient, whether you are a caregiver, whether you are a physician, physician advocates are necessary. You are on the inside of the system and you are able to speak to your colleagues in ways that um, the individuals who are not providers, may not be comfortable or may not be able to. And so I, I really hope that we broaden our understanding of what it means to be the sickle cell community and that we embrace the fact that we all play a role in our advocacy to, and we can make a difference. Just a couple of people that have mentioned in the chat, thank you, Dr. Nelson, for coming. I do want to do one final share screen um, and make sure that everyone is aware uh, that we do have um, several weeks and uh, months left in our Sickle Smart series. Um, we had some problems recording today's sessions, so I won't know until I go back into the cloud, but I'm like crying on the inside right now because my fear is that we weren't able to record the entire thing. Um, but um, what we will do is make sure that the slides are available in PDF form. Um, so thank you, Dr. Nelson, for that. Again, um, we want to special shout out our partners and sponsors, Be The Match, Bluebird Bio, um, who all of whom have been instrumental in helping to make this series happen. Um, 
Yes, if you want to be, view previous or future sessions of our Living Sickle Smart, you can do so through our website, which is going to take you back to our YouTube channel. So um, you can do that. Just search for Sickle Cell Foundation of Minnesota on YouTube and you can reach our channel. And then our future sessions later on this month, we'll also hear from Dr. Ashish Gupta, pediatric transplant physician with the University of Minnesota, as he talks about curative therapy. We will also speak with um, individual representatives from Be The Match, who is a resource for those who are um, thinking about or actually going through bone marrow transplant and yes, even gene therapy. Um, throughout the remainder of the year, November, we will be talking more on transition and planning for your future so that you can make informed decisions. And then December, smiling through the pain, how pain can impact mental and emotional health. So thank you so much for all of you who took time out of your day today. We so appreciate it. And we look forward um, to, to engaging you um, both in Minnesota and outside of Minnesota. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.